am so excited to be here. This is my, my first time visiting this beautiful city. Um, and I hope you're all excited about aliens and want to learn more about them. <laughs> okay, good. Excellent. I also would like to meet an alien. I haven't yet, um, but I'm hoping that we'll make contact in my lifetime. Um, and the goal here is to try to figure out what are we even aiming to make contact with, right? So in order to ask the question about alien life, we actually have to understand life on this planet, and in particular, the origin of life on this planet, which is the hardest question of all. So these are the questions that we're going to be talking about this evening. Are we alone? Who here thinks we're alone? Anyone? Who here thinks the universe has lots of life in it? Lots of life in this room. Okay, good. Uh, what is life? Maybe we should ask that question first before we say there's a lot of it out there. Um, and how does it originate? So how does life actually get started? And this is actually the really critical question because when you start asking about the origin of life, you start having to ask about the nature of life itself because you're asking questions about how is it that things that are not alive transition to being alive without any agency agency or intelligence already existing in the universe. So this is the origin of everything that we identify with. Everything that is in this room right now is actually the product of life, right? So imagine a lifeless Earth. We have to go all the way back there and try to figure out how it all got started. So the question of how we will learn about whether there are others like us means that we actually have to go out in the universe and be able to look for them. And right now, a lot of people are doing that. They're trying to look for aliens. Um, did anyone actually see the announcement of the discovery of life on Venus uh, during the pandemic? I know that we were all kind of under lockdown, but did anybody actually see this in the news? Uh, <laughs> kind of came up a little bit, okay. Um, so in uh, 2021, there was a big announcement of a possible discovery of life on Venus. So Venus is one of our closest planetary neighbors. And the discovery was actually of a molecule called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus which some scientists had proposed might be what's called a biosignature. So a biosignature should be something that's a sign of life on another planet. And the idea being that some organisms on Earth make phosphine, and therefore organisms on other planets might make that small molecule. But the problem is, and why this became a very big debate, so this is the cover of the New York Times, Life on Venus, Astronomers See a Signal in Its Clouds. Well, not the cover, but it was somewhere in the New York Times. <laughs> Actually, maybe it was. I don't remember. Um, so big announcement. Um, but of course, now we're not sitting here saying we made contact. What happened? Well, just like with most kinds of ways that scientists are looking for life on other planets, we had a very ambiguous signature. Um, and so phosphine is a gas that can be made by biology, maybe. We're not really sure um, exactly how biology might do it, except for uh, industrial processes. Um, but it's also something that can be made by natural processes outside of life. Jupiter's atmosphere has phosphine in it. We don't think that life produced it in Jupiter's atmosphere. So there was a huge debate on, on the Venus story, and ultimately it's kind of uh, downgraded to uh, another case of an uh, aha moment. We discovered something that could be life and then realized in retrospect that it really wasn't life. And the reason I'm bringing up this particular case study is that most of the time that we're looking for life, we're looking for life um, based on analogy to life on Earth. So we're looking for molecules that life on Earth produce on other planets. And most of the times, the one that we can detect are too simple to be definitive signatures of life. And the problem boils down to the fact that we don't know actually what we're looking for. A molecule is not alive, right? Take any molecule out of your body, any atom out of your body, is it alive? It's only alive when it's part of you, right? So we're not our atoms, we're not our molecules, we're a system level organization as living entities. The individual molecules that are part of us are not necessarily alive. Are they evidence of life? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the question, what is life, actually is absolutely critical and foundational to, act, to figuring out whether there's aliens out there. So now we've kind of introspected the question, what is life? What are we actually looking for? Um, I think most of us in this room assume that we're alive, so we're looking for things that are sort of like us. Um, but how do we actually ask that question in a meaningful way? So uh, this is a picture of Erwin Schrodinger, who probably many of you have heard of, um, and he spent a lot of time in the city. Um, very famous for his contributions to the foundations of quantum mechanics. He also had this wonderful book he wrote in 1944 based on a series of lectures he gave in Dublin the year before on the topic of what is life. So he asked this question, what is life? Um, and he says, how can the events in space and time which take place within w the spatial boundary of a living organism, so I'm a spatially bounded living organism, <laughs> how can we account for those in terms of physics and chemistry? So that seems like a perfectly reasonable question. 
Um, but of course, I'm standing here over 70 years later and we don't have an answer to that question. So obviously it's a little bit more challenging than it seems on first pass. So let's start with trying to define life. Uh, how many people here think they know what life is? Just curious, you don't have to tell me what your answer is, but I got one person, one person. <laughs> okay, good. All right, at least one person in this room knows what life is good. Very good. Um, so most of us maybe admit that we don't, um, but that's because we're here to talk about thinking you know, more deeply about the problem. Um, but most biology textbooks actually do know what life is, or at least they'll tell you what life is in the first chapter. Um, and so you'll usually hear a definition, um, something like this one, um, which was written in this really nice uh, short paper by Carl Sagan, that life is any system that has a certain number of functions. And those functions are things like eating and metabolizing, which most of us in this room are probably, you know, metabolizing something uh, related to alcohol, which is great. Um, and then, um, you know, we're breathing, uh, I'm moving a lot, um, and growing and reproducing. So there's these sor sorts of list definitions that we can give for what life is. So people usually try to come up with these kind of descriptive definitions. We see this phenomena we call life. Let's describe its properties and make a list of those properties. And in biology, because we're just studying life on Earth, you know, we can move on and just kind of describe all of life. But if you're asking questions about the origin of life, it's actually a little harder, because now you have to say, is this list of definitions sufficient to be generalizable to any kind of life that might exist in the universe? And Carl Sagan is a little cheeky sometimes in the way he presents science, so his uh, retort to this kind of list definition is any aliens that came to Earth using that definition would think cars are the dominant life form, right? <laughs> they do all of those things. Um, and in fact, now cars have been to space, so, you know, they, you know, we could make a little sort of misconception that um, perhaps, you know, cars are, are live. Uh, and so what Sagan is actually pointing out here is sort of the paradoxes associated with defining life. And I actually really like uh, one sentence that he has in that paper where I think he really, he hits the nail on the head, um, where he says that when you make these list definitions of life, Many of the properties are present in machines no one was willing to accept as alive or absent from organisms everyone is accept to, willing to accept as alive. So I'm actually gonna contest Sagan's point that machines are not alive. Um, and I will say that every bit of technology is a product of evolution in the same sense that you and I are, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So I'm not agreeing with him on that point of the definition, but the problem with defining life is if you start from reasonable assumptions, and you think you're gonna include everything you think you should include and exclude the cases you think you sh can't, you always have exceptions. Um, and so viruses are sort of the canonical one. Almost every time I give a talk about life, somebody's like, what about viruses? Are they alive or not? And this is actually not the right question to be asking. The question is, if I had an explanatory framework that underlied life, would viruses actually be a, a part of that? And viruses are the product of evolution just in the same sense that you and I are, but they may have different roles in an evolutionary process or are these kind of features that we associate to life. So the problem in my field is actually so bad. <laughs> um, it gets worse, don't worry. Um, hold your breath for this one. Life does not exist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're gonna talk about a problem that doesn't exist. Um, what I mean is, um, you know, this, this is actually a quote um, from Andrew Ellington, who's a very prominent chemist working on origins of life. Um, and it's actually the reason that he says life does not exist is more eloquently captured by another colleague, Jack Shostak, uh, who's actually a Nobel laureate in biochemistry, where he points out as one focuses experimentally on any of the defining properties of life, the boundaries begin to blur, splitting into finer and finer subdivisions. So this goes back to the thing I brought up at the beginning. Are the atoms in your body alive? Are they life? Or is it just you as an organized entity that's life? And when you're a chemist and you're breaking life apart into its components, you seem to lose the property of those being life. And so if you're a reductionist, somebody that wants to look at the basic building blocks of reality, and maybe you're a physicist and you want to go all the way down to the standard model of particle physics, that doesn't say anything about life. So maybe life is just you know, this category we want to put on nature, but it doesn't actually exist. Swallow that for a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, I found myself, uh, you know, thinking about these things and really scratching my head about it because, of course, I'm alive. Uh, I don't know anything but being alive. I feel like I've spent my whole life living. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, so how are we supposed to think about this problem if, when we're in the lab trying to think about what life is, we run into all of these kind of paradoxes? We can't draw a hard boundary around the phenomena, right? We can't look at the parts; they're not life. <laughs> 
We can't even look at the whole systems because we find all these paradoxical contradictions. So going back to Schrodinger, I like to kind of um, play with uh, the words he used and not say life is, well, what is life, but actually life is what, that we should be really radically surprised by the kind of solution we might get. Um, and he actually alluded to this at the end of his book, um, that living matter, while not alluding the laws of physics as established to date, might be described by other laws of physics. And so what I'm going to talk about next is sort of how the history of physics has progressed and sort of what is different about the problem of life and why maybe we don't have a fundamental description of the phenomena of life, but maybe we should. So just to kind of paraphrase, um, one of the key problems is life doesn't violate any of the known laws of physics, right? So this is why people can make these arguments life doesn't exist or it might just be what some people will refer to as an emergent property. You know, the fact that I'm saying your atoms are not alive, but you are alive. Some people will say, well, that's just sort of an epiphenomena. Who cares about that? That's not fundamental. Our current laws of physics can, you know, we have the second law of thermodynamics and all these things. They should describe the origin of life. We just haven't been clever enough to figure it out based on known laws. But the problem is, I think, if those laws were actually um, about life, they might solve it. Um, but the current laws of physics don't explain the phenomena we call life. Right? It doesn't explain a lot of the features that are associated to what we are. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those key features um, because I think they're really telling. Um, but first, let's look a little bit at the history of physics. Um, so I noted that Frank Wilczek is going to be one of your upcoming speakers, so this is actually from one of his papers. Um, I was very inspired by Frank's vision of the next 100 years in physics, but mostly because I disagreed with it. Um, <laughs> not in a bad way. <laughs> it's always good when you have a, you know, sort of intellectual um, disagreements because they're very productive. Um, but he did this brilliant job of summarizing um, some of the major progressions in our thought in physics in the past several hundred years. Um, and so for those of you that are not familiar with physics or the history of physics, most of the major ideas that we've had in the advancement of physics have been in terms of unifications. Um, and a simple example is actually to think about all motion, right? You can write down Newton's laws of mechanics and describe most moving objects, pretty much all moving objects. And if you add friction, you can describe even more. Um, and that's you know, regularizing a lot of features of our universe, right? It can, it can actually, you know, if I was rolling a ball across the, t the floor here, it would explain that. And it doesn't care about the features of the ball that, you know, it might be red or, you know, uh, I don't know, I bought it at Target. I don't know if you have Target in Denmark, but, um, but you know, you know, so shop. You know, it, it actually, um, you know, there's a certain set of properties that are associated with motion, and those are the only properties you care about to write laws of motion. A better example, actually, in my mind, is um, the unification, which is actually on here, of terrestrial and celestial physics. What does that mean? Well, all motion on Earth, you know, a ball rolling down an inclined plane, me walking across the stage, you sitting in your chair, are described by the same laws that we use to describe the moon's orbit around the Earth or other planetary motion or even large-scale galactic structure nowadays, right? They didn't know about it in Newton's time. Before Galileo and Newton, no one in human history really made the connection in a deep way that the motions in the heavens were this, governed by the same rules and principles as motion on Earth, right? We always, we made these, these models of, you know, the celestial sphere as being perfect and immutable and very different than things on Earth. So most of these major advances have been looking at phenomena that seem totally different and realizing they're actually the same thing. Um, and so if you come, uh, you know, more to the last century, you know, sort of the more recent radical innovations in physics are the unification of space and time, right? My experience of time is very different than my experience of space. I could pace back and forth, you know, revisit the same position, but I'm always moving forward in time. Um, and so they don't seem like they should behave the same, but they do when we're talking about general relativity and we're actually trying to formalize what gravity is. Waves and particles. Waves in part, you know, thinking something's a discrete entity versus a wave. You know, if you think about the molecules in water versus the ocean waves, they, those seem very, like, different levels of description, but some things have those properties at the same time. Um, and so, in the last century, we had the invention of computation with um, George Boole and Alan Turing playing a prominent role. The names on here are not the only people. Um, computation obviously has transformed our planet. Um, I'm here in part giving a presentation on a giant screen because a computer is running it. Um, most of you probably got here because of some computational device helping navigate. Um, 
what we haven't done yet is actually really understood how those ideas about computation merge with fundamental physics. Um, and I'm not really going to start talking about computation or uh, some of the other unifications here. Um, but the reason I want to bring it up is because when you have these unifications, it looks radically different once you're through the barrier of the unification than it did before. So right now, I'm just going to say, we talk about something which is matter, the things you're made of, and we talk about things that are very abstract, software, computation, which are things that you can run in different hardware, right? So I can say words, you can type them on your computer. Um, you know, they're in the wet chemistry of your brain right now. Maybe you, some of you might take notes, or this is being recorded, right? So they can move through all these different media. They don't seem like they're, they're, they don't have the same properties that matter does. But if you think about merging those two ideas and thinking that life is somehow matter that is informational, uh, there may be some story there. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. So these are the laws of physics um, that we know and love, or at least some of us love. I don't know if everybody loves them. Maybe some of you abhor them, but I love them. Um, <laughs> maybe we should have started over. Um, but the, so they, they kind of fall in major categories. Um, there's the laws of matter and light, so that's mostly the standard model of particle physics and quantum mechanics. The laws of space and simultaneity are covered by general relativity. Um, and we have the laws of large numbers and observational uncertainty. Those were developed in the 1800s in a field we call thermodynamics, which explains energy and work. And when you can't take exact measurements of, say, all the particles in a gas, you have some approximate measurements, and you can actually do things. So that was cool. Um, but the question is, what's next? And so this idea that maybe there's another uh, unification on our horizon where some of the ideas from past physics need to be unified with some of the ideas that we developed in the last century about information processing or computation um, might be on what's on the horizon. So why am I talking about that and what do I actually mean? Um, I'm going to give two examples. They're very anthropocentric. But these are my favorite examples of why life does not fit in current physics and of why I think some concept of information is fundamental to understanding what life is doing that's different than in standard physics. So the first example is to think about Earth. We live on a beautiful planet. It happens to be a very living world. Um, and we're doing something actually really interesting right now, which is we're launching little metal boxes into space on a regular basis. They're satellites, right? So, um, so you can see them moving across our night sky sometimes. Why is it that our planet is doing that and no other planet is doing that? So you might have a meteorite hit Mars and have um, you know, a little bit of you know, material from the surface eject into space and orbit it for a little while, but there's no process that's building metal boxes and launching them into space every day. Only our planet, as far as we know, is doing that. The reason that we can do that is because we have life on our planet. We have physical systems that have been evolving for billions of years. And at a certain point, they became intelligent enough to learn about the regularities in the universe that we associate to the laws of gravitation. So a physical system in our past happened to be Isaac Newton, wrote down the laws of gravity. And because that knowledge was compressed, this idea that there's some universal property in our universe where masses are attracted to each other and we can actually understand it as a principle of gravity that's universal, we are now able to do this process of launching satellites into space. So the reason that I think this example is significant is that if you actually look at the series of events leading to a planet being able to anti-accrete, being able to eject material into space on a regular basis in the way our planet is, it requires physical systems that, that evolved knowledge of certain phenomena in their universe, certain regularities. So information, in the sense of that knowledge, is actually causal to the fact that we're doing launching satellites. It's a part of the, the necessary mode of explanation. It's a little bit of a paradox, right? Because it's a law of physics is necessary that a physical system knows a law of physics in order for certain physical phenomena to happen. Another example, which has the same exact structure, is to look at the periodic table of the elements. So we're probably all familiar with this from, say, um, you know, a grade school chemistry class. You can actually um, add information to the periodic table of the elements for all the formation mechanisms in the universe for every element that we know about. And so hydrogen and helium formed you know, just after the Big Bang. They were there from the start. And then we had um, other elements forming in stars. 
um, and some elements form by mergers of stars, like neutron stars. And so then we get to the very heaviest el elements, the ones in gray there, um, all the way up to 118, which I think I can never pronounce it properly, um, agnesium or something, um, which can be synthesized by a technological civilization that has knowledge of nuclear physics. And that is the most reliable mechanism in the universe we know for making that element. So 118 is what's called a non-naturally occurring element. Some of these are on the boundary, like uranium and plutonium, right? We can find them naturally, but we also synthesize them. And they end up being in high abundance on our planet because we can synthesize them. But some of the elements, when you push that boundary, they require so many precise controlled conditions to produce them that the expectation is the only physical process in the universe that can produce those elements in high abundance is technology. So here's another example where something is allowed by the laws of physics, but it only happens when there's intelligent systems that know how to control the laws of physics to make that process actually happen. So this is what life does that no other phenomenon in the universe does. And you will now come to understand why physicists are so romanticized by the laws that we come up with. <laughs> um, and maybe we get some egos about it. Um, but there's also this sort of perplexing feature when we're talking about the nature of laws, the laws of physics themselves, that there are certain kinds of mathematical structures that actually correspond to the world, right? The law of gravitation has a certain form in the way we write it down. The laws of nuclear physics have a certain form. And not every possible equation you could write down is actually a law of nature. So this becomes a sort of paradoxical situation for physicists because we want to explain the universe as the way it is and not all the ways it could be. Um, and so we have all kinds of hand-wavy ways that we come up with explanations for this. One of the ones I think is really elegant is Max Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis, where his explanation for why some of these kinds of forms exist and not others is that everything is math. And some of you are probably like, what? I hate math. I can't be math. <laughs> not everything's math. But basically the idea is everything is math. And all mathematical structures exist somewhere. So every universe is basically built out of some mathematics you can imagine. So everything is just math. So you and I right now would just be some mathematical structures that are interacting with each other and have certain sort of properties with respect to um, the structure that would allow us to be self-aware and things like that. Now, this is interesting, but it does a weird thing, which it tries to explain everything by explaining nothing, because it doesn't tell us anything about the specific features of our universe. And it doesn't tell us why is it that when physical systems learn about these kind of regularities, they can do more than they were, that was possible before? So this is sort of the canonical physics explanation for the laws of physics. My explanation for the laws of physics is that the laws of physics themselves are a representation of what life does generally, which is that life learns things to make the universe able to do more things. And we can look at this even in the words of Darwin, so Darwin, um, you know, came a little bit, you know, maybe a century and a half, uh, two centuries later than Newton. So Newton thought the universe evolved according to fixed laws of motion. The laws of gravitation never change. They're always the same. And all you have to do is set an initial state for your universe and let your universe run, and you've explained everything. And Newton actually was in a time where there was a concept of God that lived outside the universe, and he was very romanticized by that, and he wanted to describe God's universe. So, of course the laws could exist outside of the universe because there was someone to write them down <laughs> and give them agency to control the universe. Darwin came along and he wasn't studying gravity, he was studying life. And he saw that if you look at what life is doing in the universe, it's generating endless forms most beautiful. It's constantly structuring new things. Those new things make new rules that then structure the next set of new things. Um, and these two kind of views seem like they're really at odds or at least our understanding of physics is incomplete because transitioning from the Newtonian view to the Darwinian view is highly non-trivial. So one of the key features here um, with all of this is that we're probably not thinking about life in the right way. We can't explain certain features, this ability to generate novelty, this lack of boundary around the phenomena we're talking about. <laughs> 
And I think one of the major misconceptions was actually in the way that Schrodinger posed his question to begin with, where he asked about how do we define the events that happen within the spatial boundary of a living organism. He was already trying to say an organism is the proper unit for thinking about life. Um, and the fundamental unit of life is not a cell or an individual. It's actually a lineage. What do I mean by that? Um, I mean, there is not, uh, I don't know how many people are in this room, hundreds of examples of life in this room. There is one. Uh, what one? There's one that's bifurcated over time. So we are all actually descendant of one original life event, as far as we know, that happened in our universe. And what has happened since then is that new life forms have evolved, and they have built subsequent life forms, and they have built chairs and tables and all kinds of other things. And all of this is con uh, uh, continuous and connected across time by the fact that me standing here right now, an entire 3.8 billion year lineage, is directly responsible for me taking a step in existing here right now. Or for me, if I threw this, I don't know, I can't be more active than that right now, I can't throw things in the audience. But you know, certain sets of events actually have to pass, you have to look at that whole causal history to explain that phenomena being right there. So when we think about the nature of life, this sort of new view that we're building to think about it is actually to think about an original life event being some transition to a physics where information, I haven't defined what that means yet, but some, some property that the system acquires over time actually constrains and determines the future and builds more possible futures. It learns, it creates. That's what life does. Um, and the original life transition is one where you have chemistry that randomly explores a space to a space of directed construction of complexity. And that's what we really want to understand. So the new laws of physics that govern life exist in the space that we exist in, but it's not a space that's accounted for in current physics. So what do I mean by that? Um, it's easiest to talk about this in chemistry, and so this is where I'm going to demonstrate this, this kind of new idea about physics and chemistry um, shortly. But if you imagine the space of all possible things that could exist, not all possible mathematical structures, those are abstract, but all possible things, all possible tables and chairs. Now reduce that space just to all possible molecules because you can actually iterate it. You take carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and you combine them together in every possible way. That space is huge. It is really fucking huge, like bigger than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Pardon my language, but it's big. I just want you to understand how big it is. Um, and it's really big even for small molecules. So, if you find an object in that space, that very high combinatorial diversity space, it actually is evidence of life above a certain threshold. Because there's no possibility, if you have an exponentially growing space of possible things, you would ever discover that exact thing at random. And this is sort of a key argument of the theory that I'm going to explain to you guys in a few minutes. So if we're talking about the laws we know and love, we're missing something. We're missing laws that describe us. Um, we don't have laws that describe theoretical physicists, we just have theories of physics. Um, and so there is a whole set of people kind of working from different directions on this kind of idea of thinking about what's possible rather than what actually happens in the universe and building laws of physics based on what's possible and what happens. I think about it in terms of the physics of existence. Not everything can exist. There's not enough matter, there's not enough time, and life is somehow the physics of what gets to exist. And for the very low complexity universe, everything gets to exist because everything can be built easily. For where we live in the space of what's possible, our existence is excluding so many other possibilities, but also yet making possible the universe to make more things. So what's the theory? <laughs> Well, the idea is, think about all possible things, but make it physical. So physicists usually like to think about all possible mathematical structures, that's too abstract. Let's think about all possible molecules. That's a space that we can construct in physical reality and maybe explore it. And it happens to be where life emerged, right? We think life is based on chemistry, or at least life on Earth seems to be chemical at its root. So I've already mentioned chemical space is vast. Um, it's actually, I mean, I, I've done some back of the envelope calculations about like the size of the physical universe combined, you know, compared to the size of chemical space. You can't exactly compare them because one has different dimensions than the other. Um, but if you look at 
chemistry, and you think about small molecule chemistry. So small molecule chemistry might be, our bodies are made of like really big, what are called macromolecules, like DNA and proteins and things like that. If you take a protein, which is composed of amino acids, so these are the units that link up to make a protein. Maybe you're more familiar with DNA. It's got the bases of DNA, and you know there's four bases. If you take a molecule that's about the size of two bases stuck together, or two amino acids, and you look at the size of the chemical space of all possible molecules about that size, you know, there, chemical, the chem informatics, people that study this area of science, estimate there's about 10 to the 60 possible molecules. There are not enough resources in the universe to make every possible small molecule. This is how big chemical space is. So if we spent on this planet all of our energy making molecules, we would never explore all of small molecule chemistry space. So life is some trajectory through that space of too many things existing. Um, and the way we think about actually quantifying that in terms of how hard is it in terms of the complexity of an object to make it is in this theory that I've been developing with Lee Cronin, who's in the audience somewhere, so I'm going to talk a lot about his stuff. Um, and he's a former uh, science and cocktail speaker, um, is called assembly theory. So what I've shown up here is ATP. ATP is an energy carrier in cells. So all of us are basically metabolizing our food in part because of ATP, helping mediate that process. Um, and when we talk about it in assembly, theory, trying to actually understand where does ATP exist in the complexity of all possible molecules. The way we do that is actually to break ATP apart. So we take ATP and we break it down just to the bonds that are in ATP. And then we try to rebuild the molecule. So imagine I have all the bonds in ATP and I stick two of them together. And then I take that and I take another elementary bond and I stick it on. And I, I build up ATP by only using pieces I've built already. So there's this recursive process to it. If you don't like doing this with molecules, you can do it with Legos. Imagine you have a stack of Legos. Let's say you have, I don't know, five yellow Legos and five blue Legos. And you have them in some configuration. Like maybe you're doing it periodically. Maybe you have half yellow and half blue. But think about trying to build that object up from the building blocks. Right? You have a certain way you can do it if you're reusing pieces you've already made. And then you can take it apart again, and you can try to build it again. And you might take a different path to get there. So what you're doing there in the way we talk about in assembly theory is you're building up the assembly space of that Lego object. We do the same thing for molecules. We look at all the ways you can build the molecule from elementary pieces. And then we look at the shortest way to build it. And the shortest way to build it is the minimal number of steps that it would take for the universe to construct that object or for you to construct that object, minimal number of steps to build that thing. And that forms a lower bound of how likely it is to form that object. Now remember, when you're actually building up these pathways, every time you take a step, you could have taken a different step. So there's an exponentially growing possibility space of all the ways of making things, which means an exponentially growing number of mistakes you could make. So the longer that shortest path is, the less likely you are to make that object if you weren't intending to make that object, if you didn't already have knowledge that that was the target, if it already hadn't been selected for you to produce that object. So imagine taking your Legos apart and giving it to, I don't know, a small child, or putting it on a tray that shakes and expecting some random assembly of things to make exactly your configuration. The, lo the more complex your object, the lower the possibility. So with our stack of five yellow and five blue, that might be pretty high, but what if I said make Harry Potter's castle you know, from Hogwarts or something, out of Legos, right? That's a Lego set. If you took the pieces of that and you didn't have the instructions, what's the likelihood you would assemble the exact Hogwarts castle? Pretty low, right? So um, somehow this sort of minimal path of constructing things actually is related to, one, how much time it makes, takes to produce that object, minimal amount of time, and two, how complex that object is and how many possible, like what's the size of the space around it? So we use this shortest path in assembly space actually as a way to quantify how assembled an object in the universe is, which is a minimal bound on how much evolution is required to produce it, how much selection, how much information had to exist. And so that number that I gave you for ATP was 21 steps. Um, something like URI might be millions of steps. It's not directly correlated with physical time, but it does allow us to order everything that you can combinatorially assemble in a regularizable way that allows us to now talk about the space of all possible things that could exist as a hierarchy of structures based on the minimal amount of information necessary to build them.
And this is the foundations, it's like the space-time of the physics of life, right? We had to invent geometry to be able to discover the laws of motion and gravity. If you're talking about the physics of life, life exists in high combinatorial spaces, lots of things are possible. And you have to have a way of actually describing the mathematical structure of that space. So this is what we've come up with. Now the reason I have 15 on this slide as that boundary for the origin of life is actually Lee's fault because Lee went and measured assembly in the lab. And that's where we think the actual boundary is. So I'll get to that in a minute. But we actually think that, I, I mentioned this idea that the origin of life is this transition in physics. If you're actually looking at the complexity of objects in the structure of assembly space, 15 steps in chemical space, and if you're past that boundary, the only objects in the, the only processes in the universe that can produce those objects are life. So we're conjecturing there's a physical boundary in terms of complexity when you make the physics of combinatorial space that life is the only thing that can cross. So that's the fundamental physics. Um, I'm not going to get into too much details of this, but we have lots of ways of talking about this. So I, I talked about the physics of what's possible, all possible structures. What we're doing in assembly theory is actually making that physical. So we don't say that everything can possibly exist. We're saying it's contingent on the history. So there's some possibility space that exists. This is assembly possible, where there's constraints that you can only build things if you built the parts of them in the past. Right? So we can't just spontaneously pull things out of the ether. Uh, all technology is built on prior technology. All biology is built on prior biology. So this idea that you can't make everything, the universe can't make everything, actually it's historically contingent. Assembly causal and assembly observed are related to the fact that we have selection in that space. So when entities like us evolve, there's functional preferences. Some things work better than others. There's actually selection on things that persist in time. And that further constrains the space of what's possible to exist. And then we have the structures we actually observe, which allow us to infer a lot about their evolutionary history. So what we think is this idea of the assembly index actually quantifies some features of the tree of life and what Darwin saw in Endless Forms Most Beautiful, but in this way where we can actually quantify it as an observable feature of molecules, which I'll get to in a minute. And all of that comes from thinking about building up from elementary things. Imagine this is not graphs, but Legos, and you're building up your object and there's all these bifurcating branches. So things that emerge in the universe have a common lineage, right? All life on Earth is related by this common lineage. And in assembly theory, I think the thing for me that's most interesting is that we are actually um, objects that are in some sense extended in time. So if I'm like, you know, I could be this cute little graph over here, you know, and you guys could be these other little graphs over here. But if you look at our structure backwards in time, we're basically the same thing. So I think a lot about assembly actually telling us something really interesting about how life exists in time. I have a colleague, Michael Lockman, that when you ask him how old he is, he says, I'm 3.8 billion years old. Why? Because he's a propagating chain of information that's been persisting on this planet for 3.8 billion years. And we all are. And what assembly does is actually allow us to resolve features of that structure. So we are objects that are extended in time. We are information that's been constructing us over time. That's what life is in this theory. So I mentioned that assembly is actually observable. So the nice thing about it is, um, Assembly theory is developed as a theory of physics that is exact at the scale of chemistry. So chemistry, for pretty much most of human history, has been a very mysterious field of science. Um, and it hasn't had a fundamental theory of physics developed at that scale, right? We have particle physics, you know, we have string theory, if you really want to go down. Some people believe it. Um, and, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. Uh, I have a, yeah, anyway. Um, so molecular assembly index um, is measurable. So it's a theory of physics developed at the scale of chemistry. And what is shown here is if you're assembling a molecule, um, when you actually look at an instrument called a mass spec, a mass spec is a standard instrument in a chemistry lab, so this is all data from, from Lee's lab. Um, you actually uh, can fragment the molecule, and the fragmentation pattern corresponds very closely with the assembly index. It's, it's an exact correlation, or as exact as you can get in experimental science. So, what we think, so the nice feature is we can calculate this assembly index based on the graph of the molecule, but we can also go and measure it in the lab as a feature of a molecule. 
So just like you might measure electric charge as a feature of an electron, in some sense, the argument of assembly theory is that an intrinsic feature of a molecule is its assembly index. It's an observable. I can measure it in the lab here. I can measure it in the lab in Alpha Centauri. Um, and so once you develop that measurement system, now you can go and you can look at molecules, and you can say, well, what is their assembly, and can I actually measure whether a molecule was produced by life or not with this conjecture that life is the only thing that can construct high assembly objects. And this is, again, data from Lee's lab, but basically what they did is they went in and they took a whole bunch of dead samples, um, abiotic samples, so totally not alive, living samples, samples blinded by NASA. NASA was very cheeky and sent some very complex things for Lee's lab to analyze um, without telling him what they were. But what it, tur what it turns out is that there is a threshold, which I already mentioned, at 15, above which you see the only molecules that were observed in any of these samples were produced by biology. And in fact, you can basically theoretically predict that it should be about 15, because that's where you would never expect to see more than one in a mole. A mole is sort of a standard measure in chemistry. Um, molecules that are that assembled um, if it was a random process. And with a mass spec, you need at least 10,000 copies of a molecule to actually detect it in the instrument. So there had to be a process that actually knew how to build the molecule even to detect it, if it's that complex. So that was part of the, the conjecture, and it was converted with the experiments. So this paper came out last year. Um, and now I promised we were going to be looking for aliens. Um, so we're going to look for aliens. Um, but basically now we have an instrument that can measure something associated with what we think might be the fundamental physics of life, which becomes a tool for looking for alien life that doesn't look like us. So remember my example of phosphine. Phosphine has false positives because planets can produce phosphine in the absence of life. And also, it's very Earth-centric. But now we can just go in the universe and, and go to any planet we want, pending we can get the funding for it, <laughs> um, and actually look for high-complexity objects, things that were the product of evolution. And this is a, a new way of looking for life. Now, for the last part, I want to talk about technology. Um, because I'm a theoretical physicist, I'm very interested in deep, abstract ideas. But they're not the only thing that drives progress. Technology drives progress. And if we're actually going to solve the origin of life, we need to wed theory with technology that actually allows us to validate the theory. So we're trying to do that. And for this, I want to, to try to imagine what first contact might be like. Has anybody ever imagined it? You've probably imagined it in a Hollywood movie type scenario. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, we have had first contact with a lot of interesting phenomena in our universe. Does anybody know what this is? Somebody knows, yeah. Do you want to shout it out? I can shout it out. <laughs> yeah. It's LIGO, yeah. So this is a gravitational wave interferometer. It's the experiment that was built to detect gravitational waves. Um, it's got, you know, arms that are four kilometers long. It's a massive instrument, and it has a precision on the scale of, like, less than the width of a proton, right? And this was necessary to measure presence of gravitational waves. There are basically ripples <laughs> through our universe that are caused by massive gravitational events, and they're very weak because gravity is a weak field. Um, so the reason I'm saying this is first contact is we had to build this instrument, this technology, in order to actually have a sensory apparatus on this planet capable of measuring the presence of gravitational waves, right? So our eyes can measure the presence of electromagnetic waves. You guys can hear me, so we know about sound waves. Gravitational waves have been permeating this planet as long as we've been here, as long as life's been on this planet. But what had to happen for our planet to actually make contact with that phenomena was we had to evolve knowledge about gravity. Einstein had to come up with his uh, theory of general relativity, which predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And then we had 100 years of technological development before we actually could confirm that they existed. Now, when we're talking about alien life, we assume we know the phenomena, and therefore, first contact is going to look like Hollywood. And I'm telling you, unless we know what the, you know, life is at a fundamental level, and we can build the proper experiments, we're not going to actually make contact with it. So we, life could be all around us, and we may not know it, because we don't actually know what we're looking at. Just the same sense there's gravitational waves going through this room right now. We don't know they're there. Obviously, they might exist at totally different scales, so this is a loose analogy. But my point with this is that first contact, everybody thinks it's going to be UFOs that show up on Earth and say hello. But when we make first contact with any phenomena, 
and we really understand it, it's the first contact is with an explanation. So yes, maybe people you know, who think UFOs are here might be onto something, but there's no explanation for the phenomena that's convincing. Right? It's explanations that matter, and it's explanations that actually have the power to transform our future. In the same way that Newton's invention of the laws of gravitation allows us to launch satellites into space and have GPS location and cell phones, um, uncovering a theory that actually explains what life is will lead to lots of interesting consequences, not just detecting alien life. But this idea that the technology needs to be there is related to this conjecture I have about a great perceptual filter, that our knowledge of reality progresses only as fast as our technology. So I mentioned, you know, the first organisms on Earth, the first life that emerged, you know, it had no sight. It had no hearing. It had minimal interaction with chemistry. All of those things evolved over time, and technology is just evolving things at a faster pace. We build seismometers to allow us to feel, gra um, you know, tremors in the Earth that are not sensitive to our motor perception. We built telescopes that allow us to see the distant parts of the universe that we never knew were there before. We built microscopes that allowed us to see microbes for the first time. They've been there all along, but we didn't know they existed until the microscope was invented, right? So what technology do we need to develop to see life clearly? Um, and the idea is that when we have this theory, if we can test it in the lab, we'll be able to figure it out. So doing massive international scale collaborations is not new to science, right? We're familiar with the idea of experimenting to uncover our cosmic origins. The Large Hadron Collider is a very good example. Sometimes people call it a Big Bang simulator because it simulates conditions in the universe that we think that haven't existed since the first moments. What about experimentation to uncover our planetary origins. We need chemical experiments that are at scale, large enough to explore enough chemical space, enough of planetary diversity to emerge de novo original life in the lab under different conditions. Technology exists, Lee's building it in his lab, it's called Computer, and the idea is basically to explore as much of chemical space as possible in the same way that we build massive particle experiments. Um, you know, Partic I'm, I'm biased, obviously, as a physicist, but particle physicists build these huge international collaborations. This one I'm showing here is Super Kamiokande, which is in Japan, looking for the decay of the proton, an event that's never happened in our universe as far as we know, but not observing the event gives bounds on the likelihood of it happening. Imagine if we built a chemistry experiment with that many automated systems exploring that huge space I was talking about, looking for life, and looking for a de novo origin of life in the lab. Um, we call that technology geocomputer, it's based on the technology developed in Lee's lab and we're trying to build it. So in short, I'm gonna end here. If we wanna answer what are we, or are we alone, we have to figure out what we are first. And I think that that kind of explanation is going to be about as deep as any theory of physics we've developed so far. And we're just scratching the surface of what that looks like. So thank you. I'm gonna thank my lab and all of you for being here.